Hey, good morning. As Jay said, my name is Travis, and I grew up in a suburb of Atlanta called Marietta, uh, Mayretta, if you're from, from Georgia. And uh, when I was in middle school, uh, I had the great idea that I was going to ask one of my friends, what do you think is my worst quality? What possessed a middle schooler to be dumb enough to ask another middle schooler this question? I don't know, but I asked. And my friend was so kind. He put his arm on my shoulder, said, hey, I'm going to tell you the truth, but I want you to know no matter what, I love you. No, he's a middle schooler. He didn't say any of that. He looked me dead in the eyes, and with the coldness of an assassin, he said, sometimes you think you're funny and you're not, <laughs> which is just ridiculous because I'm hilarious. Look at this kid. Look at him. <laughs> of all the things to pick, you went with jokes as my worst quality. Look at that comb over. Still got it. That was fifth grade me. This was probably middle school. But my question is this. Do you have a friend in your life that you feel comfortable enough asking a question like that? Hey, what do you think is one of my worst qualities? Like, what's something that trips me up? What's something that's a danger to me and to other people? Do you have a friend that you feel comfortable enough asking that question? To. And do you also have a friend that you trust enough to tell you the truth? My guess is many of us do not. Because we live in a society where friendship is not very highly valued. There are other kind of relationships, romantic relationships, uh, some familial relationships, uh, business relationships, partnerships. Those are valued. But friendships, not really. We do not live in a very uh, uh, friend-centric society, but even going back into the Proverbs, and ancient as those things are, sharing about friendship was an important part of society. Having friends was important. And my guess is that many of us don't have close friends. And if we do, uh, they're friends that have been around for a long time but aren't uh, maybe a part of our life as much as we want to. I fall into that having, again, moved from, from Atlanta. So today I want us to talk about what does biblical friendship look like, and, and, and probably more importantly, is I want us to look at the kind of person you should be looking for in friends, but also at the same time taking those same qualities that we're going to look at and saying, what kind of a person do I need to be so that I'm the kind of friend that people need? So they're going to be the same things, we're just going to apply them to other people and to ourselves. We're in Proverbs chapter 27, verses 1 to 10, we're not going to look at the whole chapter, uh, and we're going to skip verse 7 just for the sake of time. But I want to say three qualities of friends that this pro these Proverbs are going to show us. They're honest, they hold back, and they're helpful. They're honest, they hold back, and they're helpful. So let's talk about good friends are honest. Verse 1 of chapter 27. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Let another praise you, and not your own mouth, a stranger, and not your own lips. So these are Proverbs uh, that were collected from Solomon and organized into a manual of friendship during the reign of King Hezekiah. And so what they've done is this is the ABCs of friendship. Now we know that because the Proverbs are organized 1 through 21. Each proverb, each couplet starts with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet and it goes sequentially. Okay? So this is a, a manual, it's a basics, it's the ABCs of friendship. And the first thing that they talk about, the first thing that Solomon tells you is, do not, do not boast about tomorrow, which is kind of a strange thing to think about, like boast about tomorrow. What, what does that have to do with being a friend? And then you look at verse two and it talks about, hey, no, 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 it's, it, you need praise from another person. How are those related? Well, think about the way that we talk about tomorrow. Think about your plans for what you're going to do this week. The bulk of what you're going to try to do, and circumstances may interfere with this, is you are going to try to maximize the things that play to your strengths, that are the most comfortable and the most enjoyable for you to do, and you're going to minimize the things that are weaknesses, that are uncomfortable, and that, that you don't really want to do. That's your plan. Now, again, it might not work out that way, but we assess ourselves and we plan a course for our future, okay? 
I am not an astronaut. You know why? I can't do math. Now, if you want the history of astronomy, sure, I can chime in a little bit there, but that's not going to get me to the moon and back, right? I'm not going to have Indian food this week. You know why? I don't like it. Sorry, I just don't. You all know what I'm probably going to decide to eat this week because you've heard me before. It's probably going to be a meat. It's probably a chicken. And it probably has red lettering on the outside of the restaurant. We plan to our strengths. We praise ourselves, right? And then we try to find ways to accentuate those good qualities of ourselves. And what Solomon is saying here is, hey, that's not super helpful for you. That's going to lead you to a misguided life. You need a friend who's going to come alongside you and offer honest praise into your life. You need somebody that's going to come alongside you and speak the truth of who you really are. They're going to accentuate good qualities to you right? You want friends and you want to be a friend who praises other people. Anybody remember the show Man vs. Wild with Bear Grylls, right? What a great name. That's his real name. I don't know if Bear's a nickname or not, but he had awesome parents. Bear Grylls, he would, he would, it wound up kind of being staged, I think, but he would drop into like some kind of wilderness environment and then he would find his way out and he'd show you how to survive as you were navigating your way out. And one of the things I learned from him, and I really hope this is true because if I ever am in this situation, I'm relying on Bear Grylls to help me out here, is you find like a source of water, like a creek or a stream, and you follow it downstream because eventually it will lead you to a river. And most civilizations, most cities are built on major waterways. Ironically enough, Dallas is not, but mostly it holds up. This is the way you want to identify friends. Follow the stream of praise. Work upstream. So if praise is constantly coming to a person and coming to themselves, not a great friend. If it doesn't take you very long to find the source of praise, not a good friend. But if you find somebody who's constantly complimenting other people, that, that's the kind of friend to be around. And that's the kind of friend you want to be. Export praise. Export compliments. Okay? This tells you something else, too. We all have friends, acquaintances maybe, that like to like rag on people when they're not around, make jokes about people when they're not around. Very funny. Very hilarious. What do you think they say about you when you're not there? You are the source of their humor, I promise. We need people who are going to tell us the truth. And part of telling people the truth is being the same with them when you're with them and when you're not with them. But we don't just need people to tell us the truth, the nice things about ourselves. We also need people who are going to criticize us, people who are going to be honest and rebuke us. Let's look at verse, uh, verses 5 to 6. We're going to skip around a little bit. 5 says, better is open rebuke. And that's not public rebuke. That's private rebuke, but it's very direct. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Being corrected, being rebuked is actually a sign of love and affection. Somebody loves you if they are willing to risk your wrath, risk your relationship in order to tell you the truth. Now, there wasn't a lot that I liked about my middle school friend's comment on what my, quality, my poor quality was. Obviously, since seventh grade, it has stuck with me. But he was honest. He didn't shy around it. He actually answered the question honestly. And that's a valuable quality to have in a friend. In fact, I texted him this morning, not because of this. We were texting about something else. He's still a friend. Friends that tell you the truth are friends you want to be around, even when it kind of hurts to be around them sometimes. It says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. What it's talking about here is, is, is there are certain people in your life who will wound you. A surgeon wounds you in order to remove something or put in something that's going to help you. An assailant wounds you in order to hurt you, and that's the difference. You need to surround yourself, have friends that are willing to surgically remove the things in your life that are doing you harm. But many of us surround ourselves with assailants, people that are just 
willy-nilly cutting around, right? And it also talks about, interestingly enough, some things about enemies that you wouldn't think about. It says, better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Unfortunately, our enemies are not always so kind as to declare themselves openly that they don't like us or to declare openly that they're not working in our best interests. Sometimes they flatter us. Sometimes they praise us. Sometimes they lie to us. And sometimes we have people in our lives who are actually not trying to be our enemies. They're not. They're people pleasers. They're people who like to just be nice. And they genuinely think, oh, they're just doing you a favor. They're not telling you anything bad about yourself. They are doing you immeasurable amounts of harm. Now, I don't think this should be everybody in your life. Not everybody should be just throwing rebukes into your life. But close friends, of which you should probably have just a few, should have open, open range to just be like, hey, I've seen, I'm seeing this in your life. Acquaintances, don't be the kind of person that's just dropping grenades into relationships. That's not, that's not good. In so many ways, we are conditioned to reject this biblical idea of friendship, of honesty in praise and honesty in rebuke, because we are taught two things. One, to avidly praise ourselves, right? Curating our social media accounts. How many times have you been with somebody else, been with another person, you snap a picture of them and they're like, and they look at it and they're like, oh, don't post that. Or don't tag me in that, I don't look good. Right, we're curating, curating an image of ourselves out to the world, right? We pretty much are the ones who praise ourselves. We're the ones who say, this is what I like, this is what I don't like. It's all about us. At the same time, we're taught that people that don't affirm us, that rebuke us, aren't actually working for us. They're not working with us. They don't have our best interest at heart. We want to be with people who are going to say, yeah, absolutely, go do that. Follow your heart's desire. Do what you feel like doing. And the Bible would say those are bad friends. And to be that is a bad friend friend. It's not somebody worth being a friend with. Now, that doesn't mean you can't be around them. It doesn't mean you can't be an acquaintance. We're talking about friendship here. We're talking about somebody that you invite. They have open access to your life. There are no boundaries. That should be a small circle, but it should be an intimate one. So what are we to do? What are we to do now that we live in a culture that works so much against friendship. It's not conducive to friendship. We need to do two things. One, we need to recognize that we have an addiction. And our addiction is to this constant battle of curating this image of ourselves and minimizing the rebuke that we feel from other people. Ditching people when they criticize us. We are addicted to praise. We're addicted to feeling good about ourselves. And that is perfectly natural. And I'm not talking about like self-esteem or anything like that. I am talking about this constant drip that we have in our life. We receive so much self-praise that when we actually get praise from somebody else, it matters so much less. It's watered down. So we need to recognize that we're addicted to it. And the second thing we need to do is detox, right? When you're addicted to something, if you want to get off, you, you detox. And the way you do this is by every thought that you have about yourself. Remember that, the, the verse, and it's escaping me now, uh, take your thoughts captive, right? The way you do this is every time you have a thought about yourself, compare it to the gospel. Compare it to Christ. So if you have a really good thought about yourself, like this week I had something really, uh, I did something and I was really pleased with how it went. And so what I, what I didn't do initially, but then what I, what I after doing the sermon, I kind of looked at it and was like, Lord, thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this. Thank you for gifting me in such a way that I was able to do this. Take whatever you think about yourself, whatever qualities you like about yourself, whatever things you're proud of, and turn it as an opportunity to praise or thanksgiving. Again, export praise. So be happy with yourself, sure. Be glad you did something, sure. But then turn it as an opportunity to praise God or to thank somebody else. Acknowledge somebody else's contribution to it. Export praise. But we also need to recognize when we fail, when we mess up, we also need to think about what, hold that up to Christ as well. Jesus, I screwed up again. Same sin, same day, messed up again. Or I tripped and I fell and it's not a sin, it's just embarrassing, but I'm embarrassed. That's when you turn to the Lord and you say, Lord, I need you to bind me up. I need you to hold me. I need you to make me whole. 
The reason why you do this, the reason why we hold our thoughts up against what Jesus' thoughts are about us is because he thought enough about you to die for you. He loves you enough that he gave up his life for you. And because he did that, we can trust his thoughts about us. I don't die for somebody that I'm just like, meh, they're okay. Right? He's in love with you. He loves you so much. And because of that, he died for you. And if you, whatever praise you have of yourself will never be higher than that praise, than that kind of affirmation. And whatever negative thoughts you have about yourself will never ever invalidate that highest of praise. So trust him with your view of yourself. Let him speak into your life and let him speak into your life through other people. Jesus is honest like that. But just because we have honest friends doesn't mean we should just invite rapid fire rebuke. Somebody that's just happy dropping grenades into your life is not a great person. So we want a friend that's honest, but we also want friends that are able to hold back. They're able to hold uh, back. Let's look at verse three and four. A stone is heavy and sand is weighty, but a fool's provocation is heavier than both. Wrath is cruel, anger is overwhelming, but who can stand before jealousy? Okay, so here Solomon is giving us uh, things about a friend that you need to avoid. And, and over all these things, I would put this, avoid people who are volatile. Volatile people do not make good friends. And he gives us what I call the four horsemen of volatility. And they always ride together. And the first one is in verse 3. Look again at verse 3. It says, A stone is heavy and sand is weighty, but a fool's provocation is heavier than both. Provocation is the first of these horsemen. Provocation is this idea of being goaded, being poked, trying to get a rise out of you. You think about how heavy that is, how exhausting it is being around people who provoke you, right? Some people call that Thanksgiving dinner. There's a reason why we're exhausted. We made up a chemical in turkey to make you think you're tired because you ate the turkey. No, you're exhausted because you just went 15 rounds with Uncle Tom about politics. That's why you're tired. Provocative people are exhausting. And you know why they're exhausting? It's because they drag you into fights and into battles that don't need to be fought. How many of you have friends that just like to argue for the sake of arguing? How many of you have brothers or sisters or siblings that just like to debate? And you're like, oh my gosh, here they come again. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> Provocative people are exhausting. And that doesn't mean you can't be around them. It doesn't mean you can't hang out with them. It just means that they're not going to be great friends. The second of the, of the four horsemen is wrath, right? Four, wrath is cruel. Wrath here is listed as cruelty. Now, cruelty we know is bad, but we think of cruelty as something like uh, taking a magnifying glass and burning ants in an anthill and like, oh, that kid's messed up. Like, that's not the cruelty we're talking about here in friendship. Cruelty in friendship is ridiculing other people when they're not around. Cruelty in friendship is enjoying other people's misfortune. Cruelty in friendship, and you can see it in other people's lives. How do they treat their servers? How do they treat the people who serve them? How do they treat the people who come to their homes and work for them? Are they kind or are they cruel? Because how do you think they're going to treat you if you let them down, if you disappoint them? They may be critical, and that's fine, but they are always harsh in their critiques of other people. Thomas Paine said, it is from the Bible that man has learned cruelty, rapine, and murder, for the belief of a cruel God makes a cruel man. Now, I would argue with Mr. Paine about his interpretation of Scripture, but he's right about something. The way you read Scripture, if you see God as a cruel God, my guess is that you have made God in your own image and that there's a part of you that is cruel as well. And if you hang out with people who are cruel, they will make you cruel as well because it's so intoxicating. Thirdly, they're angry. A s wrath is cruel. Anger is overwhelming. This idea of being overwhelming is like the, the waves hitting the seashore, right? And we all have people like this. You know how waves aren't always consistent? 
You know, like so there's high tide, there's low tide, there's, there's something, waves don't always hit the same spot, right, every time. Sometimes waves are tall. Some, this is what it's like being with a friend who struggles with anger or somebody who doesn't struggle at all with it and just is angry, right? It's like waves crashing into you. Their day didn't go well, frustrated. Traffic was bad. This project didn't go the way it was supposed to. Kids are out of control. Boom. It's just wave after wave after wave. Frustration and irritation. And you know what you wind up doing? Whenever you're around this person, you wind up walking on eggshells. And you are so concerned about the eggshells that they've haphazardly scattered around themselves that you know what it's done to you? You become incredibly self-conscious. And when you are self-conscious, that means you're focused on yourself. Not necessarily your fault. It's a survival mechanism. But when you're focused on yourself, you know what you can't do? You can't worship. You cannot worship if you're self-focused. And so what this person has done with their anger is they've enslaved you. They've entrapped you. And again, this doesn't mean you can't be around this person. It means they are not going to be a good friend because they are not pointing you to Christ. That's what a good friend does. Fourthly, volatile friends are jealous. Wrath is cruel. Anger is overwhelming. But who can stand before jealousy? The most irresistible thing of this list of four is jealousy. And you know why? It's so subtle. I can tell when somebody's angry. I can tell when somebody's cruel. I can tell when somebody's provocative. They really can't hide that. But if you're jealous, you can hide that. You can hide that with flattery. You can hide that with condescension. You can hide that with bullying. You can hide that in all sorts of ways. And how do you satisfy somebody who's jealous? Like, what do you do? If somebody's angry, I can kind of placate them. If somebody's cruel, I can maybe protect other people from them. If somebody's provocative, I can choose not to engage in the provocation. But if somebody's jealous, what do you do? If you give them what they want, they just want more. Jealousy is a scary, scary thing. It's one of the things we don't talk about very much. We don't talk about envy. We don't talk about covetousness. And you know why I think that is? because we all struggle with it. It's kind of the whole plank and splinter in the eye thing, right? Now, where does all this come from? You want to know where these four horsemen, where their stable is, where they ride out from? From one place, it's called a lack of empathy. I am angry, cruel, provocative, and jealous if I can't put myself in another person's shoes. And so what you're tempted to do is be like, oh, Travis, you're right, and I appreciate that, but you're right, I'm going to just not be angry anymore, or I'm not going to be cruel anymore. I'm not, I see what you're talking about. I'm not going to do that anymore. You will fail. You might be okay for like a day or two, but you will fail, and here's why. You can't stop doing something without replacing it with something else. That's where empathy has to come in. So I had this thing happen to me, uh, oh, this was a while back, I guess. I told my wife one evening, I was like, hey, I'm going to go take a shower. And she was like, great, go for it. So I went, and I jumped in the shower, turned on the water, and immediately, I mean, I was in there for maybe 30 seconds, and the water pressure dropped, which I know that means one thing. Somebody's running a bath. And my kids are bathed, and unless something got real weird in the 30 seconds I was in the shower, my wife's taking a bath. And I got so mad. I was like, she knows I'm in here. I told her I'm coming to, I'm going in here. She knows what I'm doing. How could she do this to me? It's ruining my shower. Granted, it was still hot. It was fine. I was going to get clean. I mean, first world problems here. And then the Lord, in his grace, kind of got me out of myself for a second and said, Travis, is your wife the kind of person, one, who knows that the water pressure affects one of the showers? She's not aware of that, probably. That's not something she thinks about a lot. If you asked her, she would probably be like, yeah, that makes sense. She's also not the kind of person that would do that on purpose. Do you think she went into the other bathroom and was like, ha ha, Travis taking a shower, <laughs> ruined? No. Now, would I do that? Yes. That's my game. If I stopped doing stuff like that, I would have zero personality. But not my wife. She's sweet as can be. If you've met her, you know. She didn't do that. I was able to empathize for one minute with my wife, and you know what it did? It diffused the anger just like that. I wish I could say I do this all the time. I don't. There's a reason why this story sticks out to me. If you can empathize with people, if you can cultivate empathy in your life, 
guess what's going to happen? You are going to find your anger, your cruelty, your jealousy, your frustration, your provocativeness, it's going to drop way down because you're going to think what you're doing to these other people when you're in these states. It's critical. And you know why this is so critical? It's because it's what Jesus did for us. Jesus saw our condition. He saw our problem. He saw that we were objects of God's wrath. And what did he do? He came to earth and he took the punishment for us. He empathized. He put himself in our shoes, almost literally. It is hard to be a good friend. It's hard to be a good friend. So what do you do? Do we have help? Do we have help? Yes, we do. Good friends are helpful. We're going to look at three things right here at the end that show that good friends are helpful. Verse 8, like a bird that strays from its nest is a man who strays from his home. Oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. Do not forsake your friend and your father's friend, and do not go to your brother's house in the day of calamity. Better is a neighbor who is near than a brother who is far away. These last three verses are not exclusive but they tell us three ways to be a helpful friend. And one is to hold you accountable. Look again at verse eight. Like a bird that strays from the nest is a man who strays from his home. This is talking about a, a man going and, and basically cheating on his wife, cheating on his family, leaving. Obviously, women can, are capable of doing that too. And what a good friend is gonna do is gonna hold you accountable. He's gonna hold you, she's gonna hold you to your vows. So when you show up and you're like, ah, oh, man, my, my marriage is struggling, but there's this person and they're being really affirming right now and like, they just make me feel good. And I think I'm just gonna... They're, that friend is going to look at you and be like, absolutely not. Oh, you work with that person? Find another place to work. Oh, but you don't understand. No, you don't understand. Find another place to work. Two weeks tomorrow. You know what? Just don't give it to me. Go. And I know that sounds extreme, but you need to have a friend in your life that takes that kind of stuff that seriously. That again, is willing to risk your wrath to save your tail from bad decisions. It's going to hold you accountable to your vows. When you commit to something, when you commit to the way of Christ, they're going to step in and be like, hey, man, don't step off the path. Hey, lady, don't step off the path. Stay on here. Stay with me. And you do the same for them. They hold you accountable. They also give you guidance. Verse 9, oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. In the ancient world, oil was an essential part of life. It was an essential oil. Thank you. It was food. It was medicine. It was uh, uh, something that you cooked with. It was something that was fuel. It was used in religious rituals. It was used in all sorts of ways. Oil and perfume were sometimes mixed together to make a cosmetic. Basically, oil and perfume make life better. I put on deodorant. You know why? Because it makes life better. <laughs> makes it better for me, and it certainly makes it better for you. The guidance of a friend makes your life better. If we didn't have good friends to talk through our problems with, talk through our ideas with, we would make some really stupid decisions. They make life better. Have friends that will guide you. Friends come when needed. Verse 10, do not forsake your friend and your father's friend and do not go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Better is a neighbor who is near than a brother who is far away. What this is saying here is that um, the backbone of, of, of your relationships in the ancient world were your family. But in some cases, like Jacob and Esau, your family wouldn't live close to you. It was rare, but it happened. And so it's better to have good friends close by than it is to have family far away. And I'm guessing in our world, how many of you don't live near any family? Other than the people I live with, I don't live near any family. And so it's important for me to have friends. It's important for our family to have family friends. And I assume it's the same for you. Have friends that come when they're called, that come by when they're helpful, that volunteer to help you. Those are the kind of friends to have. That's the kind of friend to be. None of this should be a big surprise. Friends want to be helpful. I want to help my friends. But you know what you can't do? You can't solve all of your friends' problems. It is not possible. Your friends have problems that are deep down inside them that no human being can touch. And this is why we need Christ. We need a friend in Jesus. We need a friend in Christ. 
Because he's the only one that can reach down into those dark places, reach into that stuff that, that, that we're just not, that's just bad. And we know it's bad, that darkness. Proverbs uh, 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. This proverb is literally fulfilled in Christ. Christ loves us at all times, and he was born for our greatest adversary to t- adversary, adversity to take away our sin, to take away the thing that alienates us from the love of the Father, to put it on himself. Will you trust him? Will you come to him and say, hey, yes, I need a friend. If you're looking for a friend that is honest, that holds back, and that helps you, look no further than Christ. He will be honest with you, and he'll hold back. He held back the wrath of God. He held back the punishment we deserve. And he doesn't hold back his love. He comes when you need him. You know, when I asked my friend in middle school what was my worst quality, you know what he didn't do for me? He didn't tell me, he said, Travis, you're not very funny sometimes, but it's okay. We're going to get you a joke book with some jokes in it. You know what? Every time you tell a joke, it doesn't matter how bad it is. I'm going to laugh like it's the funniest thing because I love you and I'm there for you. My friend didn't do that. Again, middle school. But you know what Christ does for us? A friend loves at all times. When you are the worst version of yourself, Christ loves you. When you're that provocative, angry, cruel, jealous friend, Christ loves you. When you're not honest, when you're not helpful, Christ loves you and he died for you. And would you please take his hand of friendship that he bought on the cross for you. Put your faith in him. Trust him. And until you do, you will never be the kind of friend that God has designed you to be. And you'll never experience the kind of friendship that you ever wanted to have. Give your life to Christ. Compare your thoughts about yourself and about other people to Christ. And you will find friendship blossoming all over the place. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for friendship. Thank you for the gift that you said even before the fall. Even before we sinned, you said it's not good that man's alone. It's not good for us to be by ourselves. And so, Lord God, I pray that you would bring into each of our lives a friend, someone to be close by, someone to be there when we need them. And I pray that you would make us into the kinds of friends that you've called us to be. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you've done for us and for who you are. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.